Revelation chapter 8, the seven trumpets. It's the third part of this repeat and enlarge epic that we find in Revelation. We've got the seven churches, we've got the seven seals, and now we've got the seven trumpets, and then we finally have the seven salvation signs. So there's four all together. This is the third one, three, and then there's an introduction and a close. And when you chop up Revelation like that, or let me put it this way, when you organize Revelation like that, mm -hmm. it makes it a lot easier to understand. Because once you've done the seven churches and you've laid that foundation, you're simply repeating now the same basic history in the seven seals. Mm. And that repetition is found again in the seven trumpets, mm -hmm. and then again in the seven salvation signs. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, now that we've worked out a basic understanding of the churches, that's gonna help us with the seals. Oh, now that we've worked out a basic understanding of the churches and seals, that's gonna help us with the trumpets. Oh, now that we've understand all those three, that's really gonna help us with the last section of Revelation. Okay. That's how the book of Revelation is written. Yeah, each, each section gives us stronger confirmation for the following section. Yes. Now that we have two churches and seals, stronger confirmation for the trumpets, and it goes on like that throughout the whole book. And as we, as we opened last time, we learned that we are back in the apostolic age. We're back in the early Christian church era. We're back in the time frame when Jesus Christ was born, lived, died, was resurrected, and then the Holy Spirit was poured out on the early church and they went forth to proclaim the gospel. That's where we're going to begin. So, so as we start to look at these verses, we're going to be trying to decode the symbolism in relation to that period of time. And it, and it becomes easier because we can go to the Bible, we can find verses that will give us the understanding of the symbolism, but how, where do you apply that symbolism? Mm -hmm. Does it apply in the future? Does it apply in the past? Does it apply right. somewhere in the middle? Well, the way the book is structured helps us to recognize that it applies to things, quote unquote, which must shortly come to pass. Mm -hmm. When John wrote this, he was told, I'm showing you things that must shortly come to pass. So we begin in John's time. Mm. All right, we need let's, to start with a word of prayer, yeah? Yeah. Let's yeah. And then we'll get yep. right into it. Yep. All right, Jason, pray for us, would you please? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another day of uh, study, the opportunity to study your word. We thank you for the uh, repeat and enlarge concept so that we may continue to learn. If we miss it on one part, we can learn it on the next, Lord. We ask that uh, you be with our viewers and, and help them to uh, study the word as well and to really uh, gain insight as to uh, what is to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So... Just to recap a little bit, we started in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1, and we talked about how that applies to the seven seals because it's the seventh seal. Mm -hmm. We kind of knocked that out. Then we went to Revelation 8 verse 2, and we saw here a new vision. And the, the implication of that is right in the first phrase, and I saw. That usually takes us to a whole new picture that John has seen, John has been shown. And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given the seven trumpets. And how do we define the trumpets? What were the trumpets representing or symbolizing? Hmm. A couple different things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like? A couple different things. <laughs> alarm. <laughs> alarm. One is alarm. War. Okay. Um. The sign of war, too. Okay. One was like Christ's voice. Yes, that was Revelation 1. Mm -hmm. I heard the voice of a trumpet and turned out and saw the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. So we've got alarm, we've got war, we've got Christ calling to us, the Word of God calling to us. We've got also the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. The trumpet was blown, calling people to atonement. That's mm -hmm. to repentance, to, re to reconciliation with God. Mm -hmm. and, and all of these verses, we looked at Joel chapter 2, um, we can ref we reference 1 Corinthians 14, 8, uh, Leviticus 23, 24. So all of these verses identified for us why God would use a trumpet mm -hmm. as a symbol in the book of Revelation. He is giving us a message now in the seven trumpets that is a message that, that is an alarm. It's a mm -hmm. message about destruction and war. It's a message where Jesus is working through all of that. God is working through all of that to call us to repentance, to atonement, to reconciliation. It's, it's a message. It gives us trumpet a certain sound that we can prepare ourselves for the battle. I want to I want to uh, add something in here. If you all just uh, hold your place in Revelation eight, and just turn with me to Ezekiel chapter thirty three. Okay. And Ezekiel thirty three, uh, beginning with verse one. Uh, the Bible says here. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, "Son of man, speak to the children of thy people." Where are you? Uh, verse two, thirty three, verse two. Okay. Verse two. Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, when I bring a sword upon a land 
if the people of that land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he see the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet mm. and what? Yeah. Warn the people. the people that then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. Mm -hmm. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we see here this concept of the trumpets also signifying warning. Mm -hmm. Judgment is coming. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find this theme present all through the trumpet. That's right. When we go through the trumpet. So we've got the story of Gideon. We've got the story of uh, uh, Jericho. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. All these different stories relating to the trumpets help us to know what we should be looking for mm -hmm. when we get to the trumpets, mm -hmm. uh, which proceed in Revelation chapter 8, uh, as well as chapter mm -hmm. 9. Mm -hmm. Now, here's something interesting that we already noted, but we're just going to review it a little bit. Right after he sees this vision of these seven angels giving these seven trumpets, and another angel comes. And this angel comes and stands at the altar having a golden censer, and it was giving him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the, all the saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascends up before God out of the angel's hands. Now, I just want to stop right here. This is a separate vision. We noted this. Not a separate vision. It's part of the seven trumpets, but it's a prelude before the trumpet sound. Because if you look in verse um, 6, it says, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Mm. So up until this point, up until verse 6, all the previous verses, the trumpets haven't started sounding yet. Mm. Mm. So John is showing us something that is taking place before the trumpet sound, before the judgments come, mm -hmm. before the alarm, before the war, before the devastation, before mm -hmm. all of this happens, there's something else that we need to look at right here. And what we learned was this is a picture of the work of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you've got one altar which represents the cross, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's going to another altar which is uh, the, the golden altar, which represents the altar of incense in the holy place of the sanctuary. Mm. So he's going from the cross, which was in the courtyard, mm. to the holy place and the golden altar in the sanctuary, and he's taking something from this altar into this altar. Mm. And that something is described as incense. And we looked in Ephesians 5, 2, and we noted that the incense represents the sacrifice of Jesus. Mm. It's a sweet-smelling mm -hmm. savor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the picture is this. What age are we in? Are we in uh, the age of pagan Rome or papal Rome? Are we in the age of atheism? Are we in the time of the end? Are we in the Millerite movement? Where are we in history right now in this? We're starting a new epoch, so we are back in the apostolic age. We're in the early Christian era. Okay. okay. Let's let, let's yeah. clarify that a little bit, just for uh, you know our, the purpose of our study. Mm -hmm. Let's remember that these three articles of furniture. Mm -hmm which all start off the seals, the trumpets, and the, and the churches, mm -hmm. are all found in the holy, holy place, place when, the, when the high priest ministered. It was a simultaneous ministry, mm -hmm. which lets us know that whatever happens under the seals must unfold simultaneously with the trumpets and the churches. So that's how we know the first church and the first seal unfold uh, in the apostolic age, mm -hmm. then the first trumpet must parallel, mm. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. The first seal mm -hmm. and the first church. Mm -hmm. I really like that. I yeah. like that mm -hmm. because, yeah, that holy place ministry was a threefold ministry. That's it was right. all happening at the same time. That's right. And then you go to the trumpet churches and seals and the articles of furniture in the holy place where the priest ministered at the same time are all found there. Mm -hmm. I really like that point, yeah. Arbor. I think that's yeah. really significant. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. it helps keep things... It helps to keep things in order, in order so yes. that you can kind of follow. It connects the dots. Yeah. It connects the dots. Checks yeah. and balances. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. really important. We know that the first trumpet is not something that unfolded in the Dark Ages, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or something that we should be looking in the future for. Yeah. When is that first mm -hmm. trumpet going to blow? Because we're in the holy place. That's right. We're pre-1844. Right. We're back here. At the, and plus, we know that after Jesus Christ died, which is what we saw in the beginning of the seals, after he had come down to this earth, is what we saw in the beginning of the, of the churches, we know that he went to heaven to intercede for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we know when he went to heaven, he took his sacrifice from the cross, first altar, into the holy place, golden altar, and he applied that sacrifice to our prayers. 
in our last program, we were talking a little bit mm -hmm. about how those prayers, when they first came up, were the prayers of the early disciples. Mm -hmm. Remember when they were in the upper room? They were mm -hmm. praying earnestly, and they were confessing their faults and their, their, the way they had mistreated one another. I'm sure Peter was saying, you know, I was so stupid when I said, oh, yeah, they may forsake you, but I won't. <clears throat> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. forgive me for doing that. Mm -hmm. James, John, I'm sorry. That was wrong of me. You know, I'm worse than you guys. Now that prayer went up to heaven, but not by its lonesome. It headed to the throne of God and Jesus snatched it, applied his perfect righteousness to it. And it was acceptable to God. Mm -hmm. Boom, right there. Mm -hmm. And when all those prayers came up, something happens in response. Mm -hmm. And that's where we left off. Mm -hmm. What happens in response to all those prayers? Well, mm -hmm. We can go to the text and we can look at the text and it'll tell us in symbolic language. And then we're going to go to the scriptures and we're going to break down the symbols. Mm -hmm. okay. And we're going to see if those symbols break out in the apostolic age. Mm -hmm. It's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. to good, see this. good, good, All right. good. So Jason, read for us Revelation chapter uh, th uh, 8. And let's just read, uh, pick up with verse 4 and read verse, verses, uh, verse 5. Okay. And the smoke of the incense which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it in, into the earth. Uh, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Okay. Here's the symbolism. Here's the symbolism. We've got the picture, apostolic age. We've got the intercession of Christ. We've got the prayers of God's people going up. They're mingled with the righteousness of Christ, and now all of a sudden we've got fire off the altar, put into this sense, cast into the earth. We've got lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake. Mm. What is that? What, mm. what is going on there? Before that, oh, well, we have the smoke of the incense. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that something significant, the smoke of the incense? Yeah, I think there is uh, just the, the the incense altogether. Remember, what, what did the mm -hmm. incense represent? Prayers. Right. It represents prayers and it represents the righteousness of Christ. You know, mm -hmm. prayers of the saints mingle with the righteousness of Christ. So when that symbol, when you see that symbol, you need to be thinking prayer. Mm -hmm. You need to be thinking prayer, but also intercession. Mm -hmm. Because that's what our high priest is doing mm -hmm. on our behalf. Mm -hmm. He's interceding. So when you see the smoke, you think of... The intercession. You think of intercession mingled with the right with the righteousness of Christ. Okay. You think of prayer, and that's going to be important for us to to understand what happens. In other words, saints are praying, fire falls. Mm -hmm. mm. Saints are praying, fire falls. Right? Mm -hmm. What does does that bring to memory? Mm -hmm. Anything that we could think of in the scripture. Mm -hmm. Saints praying, prayers ascending, fire falls. So go ahead, James. Well, I'm thinking that, that we are in a situation here. First of all, we want to go right into, I want to go right into Revelation. And mm -hmm. I want to notice something in Revelation. And then we're in a situation here where we have to go to the Bible. Mm -hmm. and we have to find out what are these, if, if these are symbols, mm -hmm. what do they mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. So first of all, I want to go back to Revelation chapter 4. And I want you to notice something here that we've already studied. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but just to remember, because we're, again, we're rehashing, we're, we're, we're repeat enlarging right here. In Revelation 4, there's a picture of the throne scene. And I want Yvonne, read for us in Revelation 4, verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay. Out of the throne of God. This is the throne of God is represented right here in this verse, voices and, or lightnings and thunders and voices and the Spirit of God, the sevenfold Spirit of God, so the Holy Spirit. So there's the throne of God and there's lightnings and thunders and voices. So we need to understand the throne of God is represented as having lightning and thunders and voices and the Spirit of God. Mm. Okay, that's the throne of God. Why is there seven spirits though? Like, what is that about? Seven represents complete or perfect. Mm -hmm. So if you look in Genesis, for example, it says that on the seventh day, God finished his work. He completed his work. His work was very good. It was perfect. So seven is a number that is used to represent the completeness of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. 
Seven eyes, seven spirits represents completeness of fullness. So this is the full power of the Holy Spirit surrounding the throne of God. The throne of God is symbolized, all the power, all the presence of the throne of God is symbolized with lightnings and voices and thunders and the Spirit of God. Okay. okay. Then Jesus is presented in <laughs> Revelation chapter 5 as the Lamb that is slain. Right after he's presented, uh, Jason, read Revelation chapter 6 now. Revelation chapter 6 and read verse 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of... No, Revelation uh, 5 and verse 6. Oh, I'm sorry. 5 and verse 6. Okay. 5 and verse 6. Uh, let's see here. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Okay, in Revelation 4, the seven spirits of God are before the throne. In Revelation 5, the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold spirit of God, mm -hmm. is sent forth into all the earth. Mm -hmm. This is the first picture that we see of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Mm. The Holy Spirit's before the throne. Jesus is presented. The inauguration takes place. The Lamb slain is presented. Jesus says, when I go to the Father, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Since the Holy Spirit sent forth in all the earth. Mm -hmm. That's going to be repeated now in Revelation chapter 8. So you get to Revelation chapter 8, what's taking place. Jesus is again presented as the one that's presenting his righteousness to God. Mm -hmm. mingling it with the prayers of the saints. And when his righteousness is mingled with our prayers and we're praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he takes fire, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. casts it into the earth. And the voices and thunderings and lightnings that in Revelation 4 were around the throne, guess where they are now? They're in the mm -hmm. earth. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The whole power of God now is be, uh, around his throne is be now being cast out into the earth. Wow. Is that what we see on the day of Pentecost in the early church? Let's take a look. Mm. We want to go look. Now, the first place we want to look, I think mm. I've already mentioned it, and let's just look at the verses. The first place we want to look is in Acts. Acts, right. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. Mm -hmm. If someone wants to read Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. I'll go ahead and read it. Acts okay. 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. fire. Mm. And it sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay. I'm just going to read the verse again. I just read Acts 6. Now I'm going to read this verse again. And the angel took the censer filled with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices. voices. Mm -hmm. What does the verse say? They start. They had the Holy Spirit. It was it came in the form of fire, and they began to do what? Speak, speak, in, speak in, in tongues. Do you see the connection there? Mm. You see? And if you look up the word here uh, in in. Uh, acts as tongues, mm -hmm. it'll say other languages. Mm -hmm. That's the actual Greek word, other languages. They speak mm -hmm. in other languages. Mm -hmm. Because there were so many people there in Jerusalem from different parts of the world that were Jews, but they were, you know, they spoke these different languages where they had um, moved mm -hmm. and, and they were just coming to visit, basically. They were residents of these other, that they couldn't understand, all understand Hebrew and, or even Greek. And so the Holy Spirit gave the gift of languages to the disciples so they could speak and everyone could understand. So this is different from glossolalia, which is Mm -hmm. uh, ecstatic utterances, yes. charismatic utterances, not yes. the not tongues as in manifested in some churches today. We're right. talking about tongues, other languages. As in the gift of languages. So I don't understand Russian, right? but I might have spoken to Sveta mm -hmm. in Russian, mm -hmm. even though I wasn't, I, yes. I wasn't speaking yes. it consciously. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. And God gave that gift to the disciples, and they spoke fluently in these other languages. Yeah, I was going to ask something along those lines, too. Like, why is it that some churches think that they can speak tongues? And it, like, I don't, I don't understand that. That is something we can get into as we move through this, because yeah. we are going to be hitting on some of those aspects as we get further into the book of Revelation. Okay. Everything that God has given, every gift that God has given, let me just say this for now. Every gift that God has given, Satan is counterfeited. The Sabbath has been counterfeited. Mm -hmm. Remember, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. Mm -hmm. So there's a true and there's a false and there's a counterfeit. Now, Paul deals with this in a letter to the Corinthians. 
He talks about how they were perverting the gifts of the Spirit, specifically the gifts of tongues. And then he lays out how the gift of tongues should be manifest in the church. How when it's present, it should be done with one or two. There should be an interpretation. It should be done decently and in an order. And so if we're violating those principles, which are, which are God-given biblical principles, we can know we're not manifesting the gift of tongues as it's uh, authored by the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And we'll look at that. We can look at that a little bit later. Okay. Yeah. Well, one easy way to put this uh, is that we know the gift of tongues is at least different languages. Mm. So if anyone claims to have the gift of tongues, mm-hmm. they should at least be able to speak a couple of known languages. Mm-hmm. And if they don't have the, you understand what I'm saying? If they can speak <laughs> uh-huh. everything else that uh-huh. anyone can understand, but they can't speak another language, that's not the biblical gift of tongues. And it's a mm-hmm. gift. It's not a mm-hmm. learned language. That's right. It's not a learned it's language. A it's a gift. You know, it's something that you never practiced, and right. suddenly you're able to speak that language. Mm-hmm. And you know, one of the things I've always found interesting is that those who, you know, who who say that they speak in tongues, um, have never been able to speak in another language that was just. In other words, they've never manifested as it is manifested in Acts two, mm-hmm. the ability to speak in another language. Okay, we so. Yeah, I know we're kind of digressing. Oh, that's good. That's yes. good. We want to read another verse that's going to help us with that. So uh, the other verse that I want us to read that's going to help us with that is going to be Acts chapter 2, mm-hmm. verses 5 and 6. Uh, Acts 2, 5 and 6. Yvonne, do you, do you have that? Uh-huh. Okay. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now that's very mm-hmm. clear, isn't it? That's very mm-hmm. clear. That nails it. Yeah. yeah. So these voices. Now I want, I want us to read another verse. And I'm going to read it for us. It's in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11. C- get this. This is, this is way before Jesus uh, leaves and sends the Holy Spirit. I indeed baptize you, this is John the Baptist, mm-hmm. with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Mm -hmm. This is predicting Ah. the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist is speaking about the water baptism. He's saying, now when Jesus comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And so we're looking forward now. That's Matthew 3.11. We're looking forward now to what's taking place right here on the day of Pentecost. Mm. And so we've got uh, an idea so far of the symbols. The fire represents the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. That is confirmed for us in Revelation chapter 4, chapters 4 and 5. But also it's confirmed for us in Acts chapters 2. And let's see, Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4, and Acts chapter 2, verses 5 and Mm 6. The Holy Spirit was poured out, and we were told there, it looked like fire. And then they spake in these other languages. That second symbol then we've got figured out is the voices. Mm. The voices that we see in Revelation chapter 8 Mm -hmm. are the other tongues that Mm. the disciples spoke, and the other languages that the disciples spoke in. So we got those two symbols figured out. What about the the thunderings, and what about the lightnings? Hmm. I want you to look here, um, and by the way, I, well, we'll get to that. I want you to look here in relation to the thunderings in John chapter 12 and verse 28. John chapter 12 and verse 28. Jesus is at the temple, mm-hmm. and he's, he's preparing for Calvary. And as he's preparing for Calvary, the Greeks come, and they want to have uh, a, a, a moment with him to talk, to meet with him. And that's the context of verse 28. Uh, Did you say John 12? John 12, 28. I'll read it. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Christ speaking. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Uh, and verse 29, sorry. And 29. Mm-hmm. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to them. Okay. To God, is, God is speaking here. God is communicating with Jesus. He's saying, this is my son. Listen to him. And people are standing by and they hear this this voice. And what does it sound like? Thunder. Thunder. See, thunder is a symbol of the voice of God. Ah. So we've got the fire representing the Holy Spirit. We've got the voices representing the gift of languages. And we've got the thunder representing the voice of God. Now, Mm. we want to apply this again to, uh, and there's a number of other verses. I'm just going to give you the references. Job 26, 14. uh, But, we want to apply this again to the, to the Christian church, the apostolic age. Were there times when the voice of God was manifested in the early Christian church? 
And one of the examples I want to give you is Acts chapter 9, verse 4. Remember when Saul was persecuting the church? Mm -hmm. And he was going from Jerusalem to Damascus. He's riding along with the soldiers. Mm -hmm. And there's this bright light. And then what does he hear? He hears this voice. And I'm just going to read verse 4. He fell to the earth and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who is that? Who's speaking to him? It's God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus is speaking to him. Mm -hmm. See, he hears the literal voice of Christ. So here again is another manifestation of the actual outpouring of God's power in the earth. God wants Saul to be on his side. He wants him to be converted. He wants him to become Paul. He wants him to take the message to the Gentiles. And so we've got the fire on the day of Pentecost. That's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. We've got the voices. That's a symbol of the gift of languages. And then we've got this thunder, which represents or symbolizes God's voice. God at times came directly down to individuals and spoke to them. Mm -hmm. Now, he also, in the early church, he also used lightnings. We haven't identified that symbol yet, and we're not going to in this program. Ah, are you going to give us a cliffhanger? Ah, <laughs> because we're out of time. <laughs> but we'll, 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 we'll pick up with the lightnings. The lightnings are really significant also. And when we see the whole package, it's just going to be so powerful because yeah. what we've seen so far is that heaven comes down to earth. Mm. Heaven comes down to earth. Mm -hmm. So I know there's going to be people who are going to be wondering about, you know, some of these symbols perhaps have questions. Mm -hmm. The best way for them to get that to us is to send an email to sss at 3abn.org. Salvation in symbols and signs. Salvation in symbols and signs. Ivor, close out for us with prayer, would you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for continuing to give us insight into your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to open our eyes, continue to make these things plain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Father, may they move us to put our faith and trust in you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So basically what we're looking at here is we're looking at all of these as symbols. This is not literal lightning, thunder, fire, natural disasters. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Mm -hmm. So we see these symbols in Revelation and we take them back to the apostolic age. We make the, let the Bible break them open and then we see how they apply in biblical history. Biblical history shows us how these symbols apply to the early Christian church. It's powerful. It's beautiful. Got to have more. Amen. Thank you.